It is great to be with you. Thank you all so much for showing up today and for coming to worship Jesus together with us. And I pray that God has already met with you. And I trust that if uh, you are receptive and your heart is open, he has. And um, I believe that God wants to do a work in this place. Amen. And uh, we want to let him. So, uh, again, thank you for being willing and, and uh, coming and joining with us. And let's look into God's word together. Okay, so you have your Bibles, get them out. And get them open. We're going to continue in our series that we've been in called Perspective Shift. We've been, we've been looking at prayer. And, uh, and we're going to do so again this morning. I, I've been thinking a lot and wrestling with last week's message. And if, uh, just by the way, if you've missed any part of this, I know not everybody's been in all of these teachings. And, and if you want to get caught up, I want to invite you to go to our website. You can go to the sermon tab and find uh, the messages there. You can go to our YouTube channel. And you can find messages there also, and I want to invite you to do so. I believe you'll be blessed by them, and, uh, and God will use them in your life. That's my prayer anyway. But we're going to continue this morning. And I've been, like I said, I've been wrestling with this idea from last week's message. We talked about this tension, this tension of, of unanswered prayer, right? This idea of my will versus God's will, and, and this, this tension that comes with, like, why wouldn't God answer my prayer? You know, I believe that I'm praying according to his will. If I'm seeking after what he wants, why wouldn't God answer my prayer? I'm wondering today, um, you don't have to raise your hand, but has there ever been a thought in your mind where you thought, you know, if God knows everything already, and God has his own purpose, God has his own will, what do I need to pray for? Right? He already knows everything about everything. He already knows the beginning from the end, how it's all going to work out. What, what do I need to ask for anything, right? Does anybody else wrestle with that tension? It's not just me. For example, it says in his word that God knows uh, that each of us have an appointed time, right, to die. That he knows the, 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 the exact moment, the exact day, the exact time that every one of us are going to pass from this world, right? And so if, if, I'm, if I'm dying or, or someone I love is dying and I'm interceding on their behalf in prayer and, and we gather together as the church and you're praying, we're calling on God's will to be done and we're praying for God to bring healing to our loved one, knowing that, that God knows that's the last and final day, should I pray? There's some things in his word that I want to look at briefly that seem like they operate on two sides of this equation. Psalm 115.3, this is what it says. It says, our God is in heaven and he does whatever pleases him. Now, personally, I like that because we serve a good God, right? And so he's going to do good things. And so if it pleases him, it's going to be good. And so I know that it's going to be good. So maybe my prayer should just be, Lord, do what pleases you because... Your word says what you're going to do anyway, so just do what pleases you in Jesus' name. Amen, right? What about this one? Job 42, verse 2. Uh, you know, Job had a rough life, right, if you know the story of Job. And he came to this conclusion. He said, I know that you can do all things. No plan of yours can be thwarted. Okay, now I love that when, when uh, I know God is working in my plan, right, and there may be some difficult situations in the mix and I can say well you know what that's okay because no plan of God's can be thwarted I don't love it however when God is using the circumstance to unfold a, a, a different plan than the plan that I was planning Psalm 139 4 before a word is on my tongue you know it completely O Lord it's kind of redundant for me to say things if God already knows I'm what I'm going to say isn't it you take all those together. Listen to the invitation of Matthew chapter 17, verse 20. This is Jesus speaking. He says, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it'll move. Unless, of course, it's not what pleases him. Because he does whatever pleases him, right? So I could say, move from here to there, and if God, it's not his will to move it, then it's not going to move, Right? So we have a sovereign God who, who, who runs the affairs uh, uh, of history and does whatever he desires and whatever he pleases to do. And yet, he also invites me to pray bold prayers believing that he's going to answer. Right? So there's a tension here. There's a tension here. And I can't resolve the tension. 
Okay, so what I'd like to do this morning is kind of lead us through uh, that tension and hopefully answer that question, right? Why should I pray if God already knows the outcome? Why should I pray if God's going to do what pleases him and he knows everything anyway? And so if you want to write down the answer to that question uh, as we get going, here's the answer to it. And it's because he's inviting us to believe in him for the miraculous and to ask him for the impossible. Okay. I want to talk for a few moments this morning about having a faith that captures the attention of heaven. A faith that captures the attention of heaven. If you have your Bibles with you, I want to invite you to join me in the gospel of Luke in chapter 7. So get your Bibles out. There should be a pew Bible in front of you, hopefully. Lean into somebody. We'll put the words on the screen. Luke chapter 7. And, and we see a story here uh, that says that Jesus was amazed. Jesus was amazed, and that's pretty incredible. Luke chapter 7. I want to invite you to follow along with me as, as I read from verse 1. Luke chapter 7, beginning at verse 1. This is what the Bible says. When Jesus had finished saying all this to the people who were listening, he entered Capernaum. There, a centurion's servant, whom his master valued highly, was sick and about to die. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to him, asking him to come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him, This man deserves to have you do this, because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. So Jesus went with them. He was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. That's interesting to me because uh, what the people said was, this guy deserves you to come. And the man himself says, I don't deserve you to come. So I, I, I think God liked the posture of his heart already, right? He had a humility of heart, and I believe Jesus liked that. I don't deserve to have you come under my roof. That is why, he says, I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word, and my servant will be healed. In verse 8, I think he was on board with our message from last week about authority and prayer. He said, for I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes. I, I, I tell that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. So this centurion understood what was going on. He knew that, that Almighty God had sent this Jesus. He'd figured that out. Okay? He believed that. And he says, you're under authority, and you have authority. And I understand that. I operate that same way. Okay? I know how authority works. So you don't even need to come to my house. All you have to do is, is speak a word, and my servant will be healed. And when he said that, Jesus was arrested by that. Notice how Luke records it in verse 9. So when Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. I find it amazing that, that there's something that I can do or that the attitude or posture of my heart can amaze Jesus. It amazed him. And turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. This guy isn't even one of us. He wasn't raised with our teaching. He doesn't know all the law, doesn't know the prophets, doesn't know the language, right? And yet he understands how it works, right? He understands there's a throne where there's all authority. He knows that this Jesus has authority because he's under the authority, right? Yet even though he's God in human flesh, that he's also under, thor under authority. He's also under the orders and under the will and the plan and the purpose of the Father in heaven who has all authority and has now given him authority. He understands all that. Okay? And he says all you have to do is say the word. And when you do, something is dispatched in heaven and my servant will be healed. Jesus was amazed by that. And that's our first point. Is that great faith captures the attention of heaven. Great faith captures the attention of heaven. 
Now, you might say, well, Brian, you know, uh, that's an amazing story. This, this uh, servant got healed, and, you know, there's other stories where, uh, you know, Jairus' daughter was healed. She was dead, and Jesus brought her back to life. There's, you know, the, 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 the woman with the blood comes up and touches the, the hem of Jesus' garment, and, and, and she's healed. So all these people are, are healed, but when we prayed a bold prayer of faith that we hoped would, would touch the heart of, of God, and, and, and we didn't get the miracle. So, I'm left to wonder then, like, are you saying that great faith captures the attention of heaven? Are you saying we didn't have great faith? Because God didn't answer our miracle. Well, I obviously can't, like I said, can't resolve that tension, and I can't speak into every situation that's happened in all of our lives, but I can say this, is that when we pray bold prayers of faith, and we pray for the impossible, we pray for the miraculous, and a different outcome happens, it isn't necessarily because we didn't have faith. It only means, in this case, that God is using the circumstances in a different plan. And that's hard. That's hard to grab onto. That's a hard shift to make, right? But that's the shift that is necessary. If we want to have a heart that is praying, Lord, your kingdom come and your will be done, that's the shift that's necessary. That's the shift that Jesus demonstrates to us in Scripture, right? He was dealing with all these people. He was healing people, including the centurion's servant, that, that all the while, knowing he himself, right, there'd be a moment where he would come to his last day on the earth before he returned to the Father, and on that day, his prayer would have to be a different prayer. His prayer would be, not my will, but yours be done. And that is the heartbeat prayer of every believer, I believe. And I believe it's the prayer, if you want to remember this and write it down, I believe it's the prayer that God always answers. The prayer, Father, glorify your name. It's a prayer that God will always answer. In John chapter 12, people are asking Jesus about the timeline of his life, and he says this to them. Beginning verse 23, he says, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. That sounds pretty good. Very truly, I tell you, Unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. So there's two plans there, right? If the seed remains by itself, I mean, that's good, but it just remains a single seed. But if that seed were to choose to fall to the ground and die, it could be multiplied into many, 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 many seeds. So which of those would you want for your life today? If you got to decide, I get to keep my life and, and hang on to everything that I have or lose my life, and in the process of losing my life, somehow God multiplies my life into many, 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 many more lives. Many more than would ever happen if I were to keep my life. That's the question on the table, right? Right? Jesus says, this is what it looks like, verse 25. Anyone who loves their life will lose it. Well, anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. And my Father will honor the one who serves me. This is the, the calling on the lives of every follower of Jesus. And specifically, it's about to be his call. Listen to this. So we're coming down to his prayer in verse 27. Now my, trouble, now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? So we're coming down to the wire, right? And I need a miracle. So, so what is my prayer going to be? Okay, I'm either going to pray, save me from this moment, right? These people are trying to kill me, or I want to pray, glorify your name, okay? And Jesus understands which to pray because he knows who he is and he knows where he is in the timeline of God. And so he says, shall, shall I say, save me from this hour? And then he answers himself, no, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. 
And so his prayer was, Father, glorify your name. See, one plan could be that God could miraculously take Jesus down off the cross. He could send a multitude of angels, Jesus said, and save his son, eliminate the threat of the enemy. It would have been a miracle. But God didn't do that because God was working a different plan. He's working all the madness in a different plan. He didn't create the madness, but he was using the madness. He chose to use it in a different plan. And listen, that plan was the salvation of many. And Jesus knew that the right prayer, and he demonstrates that to us, the right prayer in the miracle of the moment was that somehow in his choosing, God would get glory. He said, glorify your name. That's the prayer that God always answers, I believe. It still doesn't resolve the tension, though, does it? Because you might be here this morning, you say, listen, we prayed for miracles and God didn't move, and the, and the miracle we're praying for, we're believing for, is for salvation of somebody. Right? I'm praying for the salvation of others. I'm, I'm, I believe that I'm seeking after God's will. So are you saying that, 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 that I shouldn't be praying for miracles? Obviously, my answer is, of course not. As I said in the beginning, God wants us to pray for the miraculous and to believe him for the Im impossible. And so we should pray for miracles, and we should absolutely pray for the impossible. But listen, mostly we should pray for miracles being informed by a desire to advance the gospel in the world. Right? Does that make sense? In other words, okay, I'm not just detached from the mission of God, living my life, doing my thing. And of course I love God, and of course I want God's will. And, and when I need God to intervene on my life, I'm going to pray for the miraculous. I'm going I'm to have bold faith. No, I believe what Jesus is saying is, no, I, I need to, to be attached to the mission of heaven. I need to be attached to God's mission. And as I'm attached to the mission of God, moving through life, I pray bold prayers. But the bold prayers, the miraculous prayers I'm praying, primarily are to advance the gospel of Jesus Christ. And everything else is connected to that. It's a different kind of praying. It doesn't mean I'm not supposed to pray for my loved one to be healed. Absolutely pray for the miraculous. It doesn't mean that I shouldn't pray for God to be with me as I go into this meeting or, or for God to use me in this situation. Absolutely I should pray for those, those, those things. It, it, it means that I'm supposed to be attached to the mission of God primarily. And when I'm attached to the mission of God, the mission of God is, is leaned in to my life. See, if you want to tap into kingdom power, tap into the kingdom mission. What did Jesus tell us to do? His instruction is, go ye therefore into the world and make disciples, right? That's the kingdom mission. That's what he called all of us to do. And what did he say? Go make disciples in the nations, and I will be with you to the very end of the age. If you want to have the presence of God, the power of God, uh, the miracle working power of God in your life, we need to be attentive to the mission of God, right? He said, he said, and the Spirit will come on you, and you will receive power to do what? To be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, all the way to the ends of the earth, right? So I just think if we truly want the will of God to be done, then we're going to do the thing that God told us to do. I just believe there's some correlation there. And, and I don't really know how to quantify that. And I really wouldn't try. I just know that if we think back to Acts chapter 4, if you're with us in this message series, we've talked about that prayer in Acts chapter 4 of the disciples several times. Their prayer was, like, these guys are after us. They're threatening us. Consider their threats and what? Enable your servants. Consider their threats and empower us. Enable us. Not to, not to get away, not to, to make it through, not to get by. Not to escape hardship, but to preach the word boldly. Consider their threats and enable your servants to preach the word 
boldly. We want to line up with the mission of heaven so that we can be ensured we have the miraculous power of heaven on our side and in our story. And as we do that, we're looking at every situation. We're going through life, praying for the miraculous all the time, but we're doing it with the motivation, listen, we're doing it with the motivation that Jesus would be seen, that people would be saved, that the gospel would go forward. When I'm praying for the miraculous in my life, and yes, I want God to, to step into this situation, but I'm praying for, the, for it so that Jesus would be seen, that people would find Christ, for God to be glorified, whatever that result is, whatever that looks like in my personal life. So I do believe that God heals. I believe that God answers. I believe that he, that he intervenes. I believe that he redeems and he restores and he, and, he, and he rights the wrongs and he makes things new. I even believe that God raises people from the dead. Like literally. I don't know, has anybody seen that? He might be doing it right now somewhere in the world today. But I believe that when he does these things... It's for the demonstration of his power, for the, for the proclamation of the gospel story of Jesus so that people will be saved, so that, the, so that families and, and, and communities and workplaces and neighborhoods and towns and cities and nations will be redeemed and restored and saved. And so as I'm praying, as you're praying for miracles in our lives, uh, we want to be praying for miracles linked into kingdom purposes. I want to pray for God's will to be done, knowing that the will of God is for people to be saved. That's the desire of God's heart. Okay? Now, I recognize there's still tension. Because again, maybe you're here and you've actually been praying for salvation. You've been praying for restoration. You've been praying for the lost to be found. What about my prayers? When I've prayed prayers of faith called on heaven and I fasted and I believed and I, I prayed as big a prayer as my faith will allow me to pray and it didn't even seem to matter. What then? What I want you to know today is that even if your prayer didn't get answered in the way that you hoped it would, I believe your prayer for miraculous faith shook heaven. And I believe that, that when we get to heaven, we're going to see that miracles did happen. We're going to see that many, many, many miracles happened that we may never have seen here. We're going to see they happened. When they prayed in Acts chapter 4 in that prayer, the Bible says that the place that they were gathered in was shaken. And I believe that when we pray for the miraculous, heaven takes notice and heaven is shaken, and it moves and touches the heart of God. And I realize that, that a lot of times in our perspective, we don't, we don't get the outcome that we're hoping for. What about this outcome? What about this outcome that our faith, your faith, my faith, touched the heart of Almighty God? How about that miracle? I want you to write that down. I guess you could say that's our last point, is that every prayer of great faith results in a miracle. When you pray bold, miraculous prayers of faith, it results in a miracle. And, and, and the miracle might just be that God's heart is touched and moved. That my prayer doesn't just go up and bounce around the room, but it actually winds up at a pretty incredible place. And... and I want to show that to you in Revelation chapter 5. This is verse 6 of Revelation 5. John was given a glimpse of, of, of heaven and he records this. He says this, Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center, center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders, he had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent into all the earth. He went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. 
And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense. You might expect that at the throne of God, but, but here's a part you might not expect. Holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. Okay? It says they sang a new song. So you have there this picture of, of a lamb that looks as if it had been slain. Why? It's not a trick question. Why did Jesus look as if he had been slain? Because he had been slain. Because on that day, his prayer wasn't, Father, I need a miracle. I need you to get me off this cross. The prayer was, Father, glorify your name, and God did a miracle. And because of that, he's in glory. So much so that when he takes the scroll, all the elders fall down and worship him. And the living creatures fall down and they worship him. And they sing a new song to him at the throne of God. Why? Because he prayed the prayer that God always answers. Father, you be glorified. Incredible. Look at the 24 elders. This is what an amazing picture. They all have a harp in one hand. That symbolizes worship. Okay? So worship is taking place at the throne of God, right? Okay? The worship of the saints is taking place at the throne of God. Listen, church, our worship isn't to get ready for the sermon. Our worship isn't to, to hopefully put us in a better mood. Our song somehow is around the throne of God, providing the atmosphere, atmosphere in which God lives. There's also a bowl in each hand, and the bowls, it says, are filled with the prayers of the people of God, the saints of God, and, and the prayers of the saints in the bowls are, are, are rising up like incense around the throne of God right now. So you've got the, the fall fragrance burning at home, right, in the candle or the wax, right? We do. Right? Well, well, the prayers, uh, the, the fragrance burning around the throne of God eternally, and the fragrance that burns around the throne of God are the faithful prayers of the people who believe that God can do the impossible. Your prayers, listen to this, your prayers end up at the throne of God. You're like, I know, but I didn't get what I asked for. God is working. Miraculously. And I know it because my prayers... And your prayers are living at his throne right now. They're fragrance at the throne of God. Got any prayers in the bowl? Incense rising up around the throne of God. Church, you can amaze heaven today. God is inviting us to call on him today, to commune with him. And if you don't know what to pray, let the attitude of your heart pray the prayer that God will always answer. Lord, I, I don't know what all this is, and you know the desire of my heart, but Father, glorify your name. I just want you to know this, that every prayer of great faith results in a miracle. And it might just be that the miracle is that it ends up being the incense at the throne of Almighty God. So let me leave you with five practical things that I would encourage you with, and we'll end here. Okay. Number one, don't get stuck trying to resolve the tension. Don't get stuck and hung up trying to resolve, you know, if God already knows everything, well, he already has it all figured out, what am I doing? Why am I even bothering praying? Don't get stuck in that. Just, just lean into the mystery, right? And know that God has invited you to come to him and pray bold prayers. Right? So do it. In Jesus' name. Second one. Pray prayers. Bold prayers. Big prayers. Pray prayers that are as big as God. I think we're guilty sometimes of just... We don't pray for the miraculous. We don't pray for the impossible. Listen, if you want to pray for your sick tomato plant, do it. Right? I, I don't... 
I honestly don't think there are any prayers that are too small for God. But we have to have the faith to pray big, bold prayers, believing that our big God is bigger than all of it. Number three, don't fixate on the way that God is moving. Just trust that he is moving. Don't get hung up fixating on the way that God is moving because you'll lose your mind. (laughs) Just trust that he is. Number four, and this is certainly apropos to today. Make yourself available to pray for things that don't directly involve you. I need an amen from somebody. Okay. This is when you know you're, you are, you are moving with the kingdom. When you're praying and asking for miracles that pertain to things that don't relate to you, knowing that they relate to God, right? Because they matter to God, they matter to you, right? It should matter to us, church, the, the suffering and brokenness of people, whether it relates to me or not. So I'm going to pray for them. And then lastly... Link miracle prayers to bold mission. If I could put that in like a, um, just a, uh, maybe in other words, I think sometimes the church and people of, the people of God are guilty of trying to use God's mission to try to get him to do what we want him to do. (laughs) Don't do that. Instead, make sure you're connected to the heartbeat of God, the heartbeat of the mission of God when you ask him to do what you want him to do. Does that make sense, right? See, God's mission, church, is the, 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 the lost would be found and saved, amen? So let's start praying more that God will save people. Let's start praying more that the gospel will go forward. Let's start praying more for revival where we are. And then, you know, as I'm doing that and things come up that I need to see God move in and do miracles for, I, I, I can link those two things together and say, I, I, Lord, I do want you to heal this person that I love. And Father, I believe you're going to do whatever it is that brings you glory. So whatever that looks like, Father, glorify your name. But Lord, you know that I'm asking for a miracle right now and you are a miracle working God, so I'm coming to you, Lord. But I believe that, uh, uh, that you can do this, and if you do this, and as you do this, Father, I pray all the doctors are going to get saved. I pray that everybody in that hallway will get saved. I pray that their roommate will get saved. I pray that the, the co-worker that I've been sharing this story with at work is going to come to know Jesus. I pray that there will be salvation because of this miracle. And as you move miraculously in this moment, Lord, so it's like I'm not, I'm not just trying to co-opt a miracle. Because I'm a follower of Jesus. I want to link my story into the mission of God. And then as I'm praying, as I'm linked into the mission of God and I'm praying into your mission, Lord. What? Lord, you know that there's going to be, need to be some miracles for people to believe. John said that in his gospel that Jesus did miracles. And the reason he did miracles, so people saw them and were like, whoa, that dude's a miracle worker. Some people are going to need to see some miracles, God. But I'm linked into your mission as my priority. And, and, and as a result of the miracles, would people come to know Jesus? See the shift in that? I believe that's the shift that moves heaven when we call out to the Lord in prayer. Right? My Father in heaven, there's a, I, I'm your child, you're my dad, and I love you. I adore you, I worship you, I I fall before you, you are holy, you are amazing, you are beautiful, you're glorious, you're majestic, you're loving, you're merciful, Lord, and I worship you today. It's got to start there, right? You are alone are worthy, Father, and Lord, my desire is to see your kingdom come. My desire is for your kingdom to be established here on earth. I desire for your will to be done in this time and in this place, so Lord, let it begin with me. Right, save me, cleanse me, sanctify me, establish your kingdom in my heart, establish your will in my life, use me as your vessel in whatever way you desire, whatever that looks like for your kingdom and your will to be established in this place 
and in this, the lives of other people right here on earth as it is in heaven. Let that be the burning desire of my heart. That people would see Jesus and come to know you, Lord. And Father, you told me to come boldly to your throne and to ask. So Lord, there are some things that I, want, that I need to see your hand in, Father, that I believe that you can redeem, that you can heal, that you can restore, that your miraculous, wonder-working hand can transform my life today. And so I ask for those today. And I pray that as you move in this moment, people would see Jesus. And they'd come to know you. That your name would be glorified. You want to amaze heaven? Have a faith that believes that enough to pray that kind of prayer. Hmm. I want to pray that way. And I don't always pray that way. We need a shift, friends. We need a shift. It doesn't resolve the tension. I understand that. But even in the midst of the tension, if we are willing to align ourselves with the will of God in our communion with him, John, John tells us that God hears us, right? If God hears us, our prayers are rising up like incense around the throne of God. And, and, and whatever we ask for, if we ask it according to his will, he is working so that his kingdom comes and that his will is done right here on earth as it is in heaven. And we have what we ask for. I say, may the prayer of our hearts lead us to pray that way. And I just pray it begins with me.